few of you, but I don't know all of you. <laughs> My name's Carrie Levine. I'm a certified nurse midwife, but you are in the right place. Um, people hear the word midwife and they think, well, I'm not really having a baby, so I don't know if she's the right person. It's like the major, the biggest public relations is issue I have in my marketing is because people hear the word midwife. But um, midwives are trained to take care of women through the entire lifespan, including the childbearing year, as opposed to women's health nurse practitioners who are trained to take care of women except for the childbearing year. So when I went to school, I really wanted to do all of it, not all of it except one little piece. So I haven't actually been to a birth since 2006, so you are in the right place. <laughs> and since then I've primarily taken care of midlife women. Um, my practice is both in South Portland and in Newcastle. It's a home-based practice. And I do women's health and functional medicine. So I do conventional gynecology, annual exams, birth control, menopause and then for folks who aren't familiar with functional medicine it is a systems based biology approach to getting to the root cause of chronic disease and illness so we ask the question why and try and understand the biochemistry of what might be going on for someone try and get to the bottom of that rebalance it and get people better instead of saying you have irritable bowel syndrome here take some medicine goodbye and good luck um, so I've practiced that way since 06. I started at Women to Women in Yarmouth, Maine, and I was trained there. And then in 2012, I think it was 2012, I left there and uh, opened my own practice. So my practice looks essentially really similar to the work that I did there, other than it's mine. And I'm primarily cash, and I'm in a different location, and I'm a one-woman show, so there's no medical assistant, there's no nurse, there's no manager, there's nothing. It's just me, mostly, and my laptop. My mom helped for a little while, <laughs> but she seems to have retired even from her half day a week. Sometimes she does some scanning for me, which I'm really grateful for because I hate scanning. <laughs> um, and I, when Coastal Pharmacy was just down the street a little ways um, ago, I rented a super small office space from them and did consultations out of there. And uh, Joe Lorello, who's the compounding pharmacist here, was one of the first compounding, if not the first compounding pharmacist in Portland. And when I was training at Women to Women, I went and spent I don't remember if it was a day or just a couple of hours in the pharmacy with him. And so he sort of taught me a lot of what I know. So these folks have a, a soft place in my heart. Um, Kim asked me to speak on functional labs commonly used in women's health. And when she asked me, I was like, oh, that's easy. It's just going to be like show and tell. <laughs> like, here's some of the things that are out there that maybe you've never heard of before. And let me tell you their application, because it's a world of testing that most conventional practitioners are not aware of and don't have access to. Um, so when I was at Women to Women, that was one of those places that was a little bit of a clearinghouse internationally, really, for women who had been around all of the blocks. They would show up there having been to the Mayo, been to Hopkins, been to Dana-Farber because they had fatigue or GI issues or whatever they had and they'd had all of the conventional testing up one side down the other and that nobody had any answers for them. And so when they got to us at Women to Women and there was this whole sort of um, closet of other testing modalities and this other way of looking at health issues, a lot of times people got helped. So my qualifiers are this. Um, I'm not here to pr promote any specific lab testing company. And in fact, there is a rep from a lab testing company here. Sorry. Okay. It's totally great, but I was like, oh my gosh, I don't have a Spectracell test. <laughs> <laughs> so, I'm not here for that reason. I'm just here per to learn. Perfect. So I'm not here to endorse any specific lab. Like, that's one of my qualifiers. There are a whole plethora of labs out there. There's a few that I use because it's what I know. Like most of us, I'm totally a creature of habit. They're the tests largely that I trained with and I'm most familiar with. There are other testing companies that do hormone testing. There are other companies that do food sensitivity testing. There are other companies who do micronutrient testing. Like, So this isn't about promoting any particular lab. That's one caveat. 
The other caveat is I will tell you is that all of this is controversial from a, con from a conventional medical perspective. And I always educate people to that end. You know, people will say, well, but I went to my allergist and I had allergy testing done and I wasn't allergic to anything. And I'll say, well, there's different ways to be allergic to things. And some of these tests can look at some of the less tested, less conventional ways. And, um, you know, something like, um, Sometimes I'll tell people, you can do the test, but if you take the results to the gastroenterologist, the gastroenterologist is going to look at the results and laugh at you. You know, and so I use these tests as compasses, really, in an attempt to try and find direction um, as to which way to go to try and help someone get to the bottom of a health issue. They, um, I mean, most of these lab companies are working really hard to develop the research and the database to support their methodologies, but from a conventional medical perspective, in my opinion, most of the th these things are not going to be regarded highly. So that's easy for me and the patients that I see because by the time they get to me, like I said, they've often done all of the conventional testing and it didn't yield them relief from whatever is going on for them. So by the time they get to me, they're open to doing things that are maybe a little bit more um, controversial or whatnot. So, um, so the first thing that I wanted to talk about is just conventional labs that I often will order. And I, I never, I don't, there's no protocol <laughs> for me. There's no, I do this with everybody. I don't practice that way. I take care of individuals and it is always a conversation that is balancing all of the factors that we balance when we make decisions about our health care. I saw a woman today who hadn't had an annual exam in four years and she has a $13,000 deductible which totally makes me want to scream because somebody is calling that health insurance. And she said, but I've saved a ton of money in the HSA so that if I need to do testing, I can do testing. And uh, she turned 50 this year, and I am a fan of decades. I'm a fan of doing bigger blood workups on the decades, mostly because I'm worried that as I get old, I'm not going to remember. And I think it's a nice tool <laughs> for women that as we get old, if you're like, when did I, I don't know, when did I have my cholesterol? I don't know. Has it been three years? Has it been, I don't know. Oh, okay, I had my cholesterol last tested when I was 50 or 60 or 40, and I feel like it's a nice organizing way to help us remember when we did tests. So I said to her, I said all of what I just said to you, which is like, it's not a bad time to think about maybe a slightly bigger blood workup, just not that you're gonna wanna do that every year, but to benchmark at some sort of abstract uh, time interval. And so we kind of talked it through and I was like, I don't really think you need thyroid testing. There's nothing that you've explained to me that makes me think that you have thyroid issues going on. I think there's benefits to looking at a cholesterol in terms of if some of those markers are elevated, then we have a window of time in which we can do something about things before you have a cardiac event. <laughs> and I think it makes sense to look at a hemoglobin A1C, which tells me about blood sugar over the last three months, as sort of a gross measure of are you insulin resistant or not? Because again, if her hemoglobin A1C is elevated, then I can make a whole bunch of assumptions about other things that are going on for her and what she's at risk for. And so, and, and a vitamin D, because she, why did we say vitamin D? She had tested low in the past. And so we didn't, I didn't do all of this with her. You know, we sort of talked it through, and because we were weighing out this individual woman, how she lives, how she eats, how she manages her stress, and her finances, and her insurance policy, what we came up with was a cholesterol, a hemoglobin A1C, and a vitamin D. That felt like a good use of her resources. Um, but if someone says to me, I want the works, give me the works, Carrie, because some women walk in and say that. They're like, I want it all. I haven't had anything done, or I want to know everything I can possibly know, or my deductible is paid off, or whatever. This is the stuff that, we'll talk, that I'll talk to them about. So a CBC is a complete blood count. That's going to look at white blood cells and red blood cells. It's going to screen for anemia. It's also going to tell me one of the best markers I like in a complete blood count is an eosinophil. And an eosinophil is a marker that's used for food allergies. And that's not even 
like alternative medicine. When you look in the conventional lab interpretation manual and you look at eosinophil, it says food allergy. And so it always amazes me when people come with a CBC and they say, well, my practitioner said it was normal and I look and I see the eosinophils are elevated and I'm thinking, somebody missed, your food. you've got food allergies and maybe if it was elevated, they didn't really know what to do about that. So that's the CBC. The CMP, or Comprehensive Metabolic Panel, that's going to look at some liver function, calcium, protein. Those are the big things that I'm looking at there. I'm, and I'm looking at liver function, like conventional liver function. Is, are the liver function labs looking OK? A thyroid panel. So this is something that I could talk for endless amounts of time on. Lots of people will say I had my thyroid tested and what they had was a TSH done. TSH is really secreted from the, is it the hypothalamus to the pituitary or the pituitary to the hypothalamus? I get them mixed up. So it actually has very little to do with how your thyroid is actually functioning. It's a messenger. A TSH is not enough. That's my take home message. That's going to tell you about brain function, not thyroid function. So if you think you've got thyroid stuff going on, you want to make sure you get all the markers. I'm typically doing antibodies because they are surveillance for autoimmune disease. Elevated antibodies are consistent with a diagnosis of Hashimoto's thyroiditis. If I see elevated thyroid antibodies, I'm thinking the autoimmune process is turned on and I want to know what's turned it on. Because again, I'm asking why. I care much less if it's Hashimoto's, Sjogren's, rheumatoid, or any other autoimmune. To me, they're all the same because the root of them all is in the gut. When I see elevated thyroid antibodies, I think food sensitivities, and I'm going to talk to you about that in a little while. Vitamin D3 has gotten lots of press in terms of cancer prevention, bone health, and mood elevation. Anybody with a sort of component of seasonal affect disorder probably has some element of vitamin D deficiency. Vitamin D, I am routinely checking in women who are concerned about their bones. So I generally see the women who have osteopenia or osteoporosis but don't want to take medication, and the, but they want to know what can they do. And watching your vitamin D and testing twice a year, making sure that those levels are normal is something that you can do. Vitamin D actually has to do with bone growth as opposed to calcium, which really just serves as a transport molecule to get nutrients in and out of the bone. It's just like a shuttler. It doesn't actually have to do with bone health. Fasting and two-hour insulin and glucose are screening for insulin resistance and type 2 diabetes. And I will say that insulin resistance is essentially the underminer of the majority of chronic illness and disease. It is that high blood sugar and the dysregulation of that that underlies heart disease, stroke, Alzheimer's, obesity, hormone imbalance. I don't know, does anybody want to add anything else to the list? Huh? Diabetes. Diabetes, yep. So insulin resistance, not managed, progresses to, di to type 2 diabetes, which is a complete lifestyle illness that does not necessarily need medication but needs really great exercise and nutrition coaching. Hemoglobin A1C tells me about blood sugar over the last three months. So sometimes I like the fasting two hour, fasting in two hour. Sometimes I want a bigger picture. I kind of want 10,000 feet. Like, yay, your fasting sugar and insulin look good, but really, over the last three months, how good is it? I want to know. It's a little bit more revealing. And then it can tell me, like, oh, her pancreas is keeping up with what she's eating and how she's moving, or her pancreas is really not keeping up. And we need to address this, like, now. High sensitivity CRP or HSCRP. This is a marker that's conventionally used um, status post a cardiac event in emergency rooms, but it has been accepted as a marker for systemic inflammation, meaning it is a marker to say that you have inflammation in your body somewhere. And the thing about inflammation is that it will move around. It doesn't, you know, and this is where Western medicine can really be a disservice, people will say, well, I'm suffering for plantar fasciitis, so I'm seeing the physical therapist for that. And then I've got bursitis, so I'm looking to have surgery for that. And I've got recurrent bronchitis, so I'm taking Flonies for that. 
and I've got recurrent sinusitis, so I'm considering sinus surgery for that. And what happens is people will address one of those specific issues, but if they don't get to the root cause of the inflammation, it's just gonna keep moving around until it gets dealt with. And the major driver of that inflammatory process generally is food sensitivities, stress, and or blood sugar dysregulation. It's like it all comes back to the same stuff. <laughs> you'll get tired of listening to me, I promise, <laughs> but you'll get it. <laughs> um, CVRMP is a kind of cholesterol testing that is, offers a little bit more detail than just a fasting lipid profile. And this gives me a little bit of breakout on the low density lipoprotein because not all low density lipoproteins are the same. And it also gives me a lipoprotein little a which gives me a sense of someone's genetic risk for having high cholesterol. And then if something on that screen's abnormal then I'm generally talking to them about the Boston Heart Test and I'll talk to you a little bit about that one as well. A homocysteine is, is a marker that has to do with folic acid sufficiency in the body and the body's ability to convert it into a usable form. If this comes back abnormal, then I generally am doing a slightly deeper dive to look at a few genes, genes that are tested through the conventional lab. Do people have questions about any of that? Okay. So these labs that we're gonna talk about are in no particular order. They're just the order I typed them in. Um, and, I, and these are the ones that I use the most. You might see a different practitioner or a different practitioner may give the same talk and end up with completely different labs on the table. So I'm just really talking about my clinical practice and how I do it. And um, so the Alatess is a food sensitivity panel. The GI effects is a stool test that looks at the balance in the microbiome. I'll tell you more about it. The WHHA, I should have spelled out, that's a women's hormones health assessment. Nutrival is a comprehensive nutritional evaluation. Boston Heart is primarily cholesterol, but I'll tell you a little bit more about that. Rhythm Plus is a saliva hormone panel for women who are still menstruating who want to understand their hormone levels. And small, the SIBO test is a breath test that's for small intestine bacterial overgrowth. So this food sensitivity plant panel, it's blood, it's one tube, and Alatess, I mean, they actually offer way more than I typically order. So what I typically order is 184 foods, so that you can look at 184 of the most common American foods, and whether or not you're having an IgG reaction to them, and IgG is a sensitivity, not a conventional allergy. And so this is where the allergist would be like, oh, ha, 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 ha. IgG means nothing. Um, this is a sample result report. Any food in red is creating inflammation in the person's body. One-starred foods are creating mild inflammation. Two-starred foods are creating moderate inflammation. Three-starred foods are creating significant inflammation. Typically, you eliminate those foods. I tend to run conservative in my approach with food elimination, and I tell people, eliminate all of them, one, two, or three star for three months. Like, it's just easier than being like, well, but can I have the one stars once every couple days? And, you know, what I tell people is, if you're out, don't worry if there's a little bit of sage in the chicken. Like, that's probably not what's creating your muscle pain and debilitating fatigue. I saw a woman today, uh, she must be in her 60s, and she is so tired and in so much pain. She's in pain all day, every day, and she is struggling hard. She, I'm sure, has blood sugar issues. I'm trying to think if I did her blood sugar. I remember she had an elevated thyroid antibody. Her vitamin D was a little bit low, and her entire dairy and egg section was red. And that's where I find this test to be really helpful. Like you can, you can like try and split apart the details, but when there's a concentration like that, to me it seems pretty clear. Like I said to her, dairy and eggs are not your friend. And she said, I'm a cheese addict. 
she said, I am not going to be able, like, I, she was crying. She's like, I don't know how I'm going to not eat cheese. And I said to her, try it for 30 days. If you feel better and you don't hurt quite so much and you're not quite so tired, it might feel easier to let it go. Just try it. Run a little experiment. You're a population sample of one. See what happens. And it's not forever. Like, it's not intended, food elimination is not intended to be forever unless it's a true allergy. And so I said to her, just see if you can get your head around 30 days. And we did menu planning. We came up with four breakfasts, four lunches, four dinners within the context of her findings so that she had a sense of what she could eat. She needed to work through some of the things in her fridge. I said, that's great. Eat through your stuff in your fridge. Like, it doesn't matter. This, the test results will still be here when you're ready for them. So um, this test is not always 100% accurate. Sometimes stuff comes up that people don't eat, and they're like, why did that come up? And sometimes people um, know that they're sensitive to stuff that doesn't show up red. So it's not 100%, but like I tell people, I use it as a compass. And when I saw a result like I saw earlier today with dairy and egg, uh, every single one of the foods was either two or three stars. I said to her, I'm not worried about the black pepper that's a one star. I'm concerned that the dairy and eggs are creating the pain that, e that is debilitating you. So that's how that gets applied. Did you say that the regular having doctors who Yes. They, yeah. They don't even feed them food? No. Not, in ge not generally, I wouldn't say in general. It would take a relatively liberal, open-minded physician to say, great, give it a try. I mean, I think that there's, I think that there's change afoot um, because of the prevalence of celiac disease and even the acknowledgement now by the conventional GI community that there is gluten intolerance, you know, that there maybe is some kind of continuum that these things exist on. So some of the more open-minded practitioners, I would say, are willing to acknowledge it. But in general, the word that I get is practitioners are like, well, you can try that. So and food allergies. So food allergies tend to be more compelling. And you know, if an allergist can test for it, then it's accepted. Yeah. So what I don't have a slide for is that this company, Alatest, does test IgE, which is a more conventional immunoglobulin for food allergies. And they generally look at 12 different foods. I can't, it's like milk, tomatoes, almonds, chicken, beef. I can't remember, corn must be on there. I can't remember the rest of it. Soy, yeah. Um, it depends what you choose. So let me come back to that question, yeah. So this is a candida report. This is one of the things that I order frequently. Um, candida is normal part of our body flora. We want it there. It's part of our healthy ecosystem. The issue arises when there's an overgrowth. And so like I said to this woman today, food isn't evil. It's not the food that's the problem. It's that there's something in your gut that's out of balance. Your microbiome is not in balance. In a microbiome that's balanced, you can generally have small amounts of any food. Because women and food is, can be a potentially very complicated issue. And food restriction for some women can be a huge button pusher. Um, and I know for me, I, I, I like don't restrict my food. <laughs> you can't do that to me. And many women respond that way. So um, candida is often an underwriter of things like depression, constipation, eczema, psoriasis, itching, lichen sclerosis, which is an autoimmune pro process that has to do with a thickening of the vaginal tissue that results in itching, like I'm going to rip my hair out kind of itching, particularly that's worse at night. I would say that candida is an often, often culprit of that. So other things that Alatest tests for are mold. I've only run that a few times. I don't do a ton of testing with mold because I tend to think if you can get the microbiome healthy without treating the mold, then the person can tolerate mold in the environment, right? If you decrease 
there's this whole concept of uh, toxic load. If you can decrease the toxic load by pulling out the inflammatory foods, modulating stress in their life, rebalancing the microbiome, then they can sort of manage life on earth a little, with a little bit more ease. Um, but I have tested both, they do environmental mold, they, they do a, a variety of different mold panels, and I'm, they do a couple of other things. So the, Katrina, to answer your question, when I do 184 of the IgG, you can also do 96, and the 12 for the IgE, which is the allergy, and the Candida panel, that's $344 generally not covered by insurance, although some people can submit to Anthem and get it covered. The Candida profile itself is $100, so if you don't do that, it's $244. And then like I said, you can knock the price back even a little bit more by testing 96 foods as, 100, as opposed to 184 foods, but it's the difference of like 50 or 70 bucks. And so generally when we're talking about it, women are like, whatever, just do the 184. Like if I'm gonna pay for it, just let's get the most information we can. Any other questions about the food sensitivity testing? So I use this a lot for irritable bowel, either with constipation or diarrhea, any autoimmune issue, um, any skin issue, psoriasis, eczema. Some people just show up with itching, like the woman I was telling you about with the dairy. She itches all over, all over. Um, Candida often presents with itchy ears, like itching in the ear like that you can't quite get to. So those are some of the indications of when I would do the food sensitivity testing. Questions? I hadn't heard that before. The itchy ear thing? And the lichens. Yeah. The lichens, yeah. Being correlated to candida. Yeah, for sure, yeah. yeah. Autoimmune, so lichen is autoimmune. So anybody with a lichen process, which is a fungus, <laughs> it would make sense that candida may very well be a part of that picture. Yeah. Any other questions before I move on? Okay. All right. So. Again, when anybody shows up with any autoimmune issue or chronic fatigue, fibro, those kinds of what I call trash bag diagnoses, I'm thinking about their gut. And I have two tests that are sort of my go-to for an evaluation of the gut. One is the food sensitivity test that we just talked about, and the other is the GI effects. This is a stool test that's offered through Genova Diagnostics. Um, Genova is a long-standing functional laboratory company. They used to be known as Great Smokies. They're in Asheville, North Carolina. I don't even know when they started. Does anybody know? I don't know. They've been around for a long time. And I use a lot of their tests because that's like how I grew up. It's habit. That's why I do theirs. <laughs> um, and they've had many different um, versions of this test and other stool tests that have advantages and disadvantages. I tend to do this one because it is a one day stool collection as opposed to a three day stool collection. And yes, this is a stool collection that you do at home by yourself. So in the test kit comes a tray and a spatula and a specimen container. And it's generally easier to get people to do that for one day than three days. <laughs> and the price point is pretty good. So so their pricing structure is a little bit complicated. They, for everything except they have their own food sensitivity test, for all of their testing, they actually will build to Medicare directly. So that's a huge boon for people who have Medicare. And then they have a tiered pricing system. So don't quote me on this, but I want to say there's a minimum out-of-pocket expense about 170 for the stool test and a max out-of-pocket if you have insurance for 400. So you have to submit payment for the roughly 170 when you send in the sample. Genova tries to fetch what they can from your insurance company and then they'll invoice you not to exceed $400-ish. I should have brought the prices, but I didn't. So it's that's the ballpark. It could be 380. Yeah. That's we what we're talking. They collect from insurance. I think we paid about something. Total. Yeah. 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 We get a lot of yeah. It's a lot of information, and um, and again, Medicare will cover it. So that's huge. So um, this is this test gives me a sense of what's going on in the microbiome. 
Is there microbiome meaning the community of microbes that are in the intestines? And there is a lot of research that is coming out about the health of the microbiome, even in the lay literature, like it was on the cover of Time magazine. And so the thinking is that we have trillions of organisms that line our intestines, and those organisms, the ones that are there, are the determinants in large part of our health. They're linking everything from obesity to schizophrenia back to the population of organisms that live in our intestines. And so we want there to be nice, robust diversification with a good balance between good bacteria, like protective bacteria, and bacteria that if it's there and proliferates can create problems. And you want there to be enough digestive enzymes, and you want there to be enough hydrochloric acid, and all of those things are compromised by things like Tums and pepsid and sugar and processed food and antibiotics and stress and alcohol and there was another one I really wanted to mention but I can't remember what it was we'll see if it comes to me um, so I gave a talk not long ago at the Maine Nutrition Council Katrine was there and a and when I was preparing for it, I, I was really struck by this notion that there's like, there's like a village living in my intestines. And if I want them to take good care of me in terms of I don't want cancer and I don't want mental health issues and I don't want disease, I need to take care of them. And the way I take care of them is I give them the most beautiful food I can possibly muster. I manage my stress in healthy ways and I don't bombard them with non, like things that don't come from the earth, meaning medication and those kinds of things, substances. Does that make sense? So this test tells me is there infection going on in the gut? Meaning, is there an overgrowth of bacteria? Oh, that's what I wanted to say. So, in the same way that food is not the problem, one organism is not necessarily a problem. Sometimes it is, like if it's a parasite, that can be a problem. But when there's overgrowth of one of the trillion organisms in your gut, that organism in and of itself is not the problem. It's an issue of balance. Does that make sense to people? Okay, it's so important because people are like, food is evil. I'm like, mm, your gut's not balanced. You know, it's not the broccoli or the almonds that are the problem. It's that your gut isn't balanced, that's the problem. And when your gut's balanced, the almonds are okay. So in the same way in a, gal in a balanced gut, some of these organisms, not actually the ones that are up there. <laughs> um, they're, they're, they just need to like, they need to chill out. They need to stop proliferating and growing a little bit. They need to stop overpopulating. That's the issue. It's like an issue of over or underpopulation. So looking for infection, looks at markers related to inflammation, gut markers related to inflammation. Interestingly, the markers up there are eosinophil protein X. Remember I said eosinophil? Marker for food sensitivity, boom, there it is in your stool. Pancreatic, so insufficiency, this is looking at is there enough, um, di are there enough digestive enzymes and is there enough hydrochloric acid? That's what I wanted to say. The other thing that largely compromises gut health is gallbladder removal. People think it's not a big deal and it's huge. Huger than huge. Um, in the same way that people once thought appendix removal was not such a big deal, that's panning out to maybe be a little bit different too. So our structures have function. We should revere them for that, in my opinion. <laughs> um, and then imbalance. So this sample report shows a decrease in beneficial bacteria, otherwise known as probiotics, and an increase in, po in potentially pathogenic yeast and fungi. So the stool test actually will test for yeast as well, and it will speciate it because there's more than one species other than candida. Um, and then it also, this test also now looks for parasites, which is a new addition. It's a new add-on to them. And I only gave you the first page of some of these because we could go on and on and on. The commensal balance, that lower left-hand block, 
is looking at you relative to a healthy population and saying, what's the balance of the microorganisms in your gut? Is it good? Is it not good? This person's middle of the road, like in the yellow, sort of headed toward the red, but at the top of the range, so could be worse. And then looking at a variety of specific organisms, you relative to a healthy cohort or a healthy group of people, do you have the same sort of general distribution of organisms? So the food sensitivity panel and the GI effects together for me are sort of the foundation assessment tools that I use for gut health, which is at the root of a lot. Do people have questions about any of that? Is there a reliable microbiome test that's not stool? Is there a remarkable, a reliable microbiome <laughs> test that's not stool? Not that I'm aware of. But that no, doesn't. For collection purposes. You got poop. <laughs> that might poop, and I just don't want to collect it. Yet. Oh, so so that's interesting because the NutriVal, which we're going to talk about, does use urine and blood, and does look at some markers related to gut health. Right. Yeah. So you can get around the stool collection. <laughs> if, <laughs> it's a good well, question. <laughs> it's a great question. It's a many stool collection, so if you need any help. <laughs> I'm not going to ask you why. Katrina's your girl. <laughs> Any other questions about that for now? Okay. How do you talk your provider into order? They don't. You have to see someone like me. Because you have to have an account with the lab, which most conventional practitioners are not going to have. I have a very old practitioner. Who is that? Oh, so she's in Encompass in the same building and she would like to know more about these tests and order them and I don't know if she has an account or not, but she might be willing because she comes to my office and picks my brain a lot. Yeah. All right, so I see a lot of women for hormone balance at all ages. It could be 13 or it could be 55 or it could be 70. Um, I see women who have never been on hormone therapy and are having things going on that they maybe want to consider it. I see women who've been on hormone therapy forever and have never had their practitioner test their blood levels. I've seen women who have been on conventional oral synthetic hormones and heard something or read something or read Suzanne Summers' book and come running in and are like, oh, I don't know what my doctor put me on, I think I want bioidenticals. So, I see a lot of people for hormone balance and when I'm taking care of a menopausal woman who either wants a baseline for her hormones or who has been on hormone therapy or um, we start on hormone therapy and then we want to evaluate the treatment, this is the test that I use. And this is another Genova Diagnostics test. I don't know, well the Dutch test right now is another hormone test. I wanted to ask you about that. Yep, that's getting a lot of press. And um, that test is, I believe, uh, like you pee on strips and so you send in the strips that are dried urine strips. I'm not sure about the cost on the Dutch test. I think it's like two something. Two something. Um, I just saw one of the reports for the first time a patient had it done with another practitioner and brought it in. And I, I had heard about it a number of years ago and, and I emailed Bethany Hayes. Do people know who she is? So she's an OBGYN in our community, interestingly. She worked, um, well, she had her own practice and then she started True North and she worked largely out of Mercy. And so back in my baby delivering days when I was training at Mercy, she was my backup OBGYN. So I have this super long history. She's now on the teaching faculty at the Institute for Functional Medicine, which is the organization that I certified with. And she's, she's not in clinical practice anymore, but she is deeply steeped in the research and she always has been. Like she knows the research and she likes it. And so I emailed her and I was like, hey Bethany, what do you know about the Dutch test? And she said at that time she didn't think that the research was there to support it. What was that? Huh? What, what did you email her? This was years ago. And so it's... 
they have evolved and they're surfacing again in a big giant way and I recently asked another physician um, it was a little bit of a complicated ask because this physician is employed by Genova and Genova has their own hormone panel so there's a little bit of a conflict there but I was talking to her about something else and I was like so what's your take on the Dutch test and she said it sounds like it's still like the data is still they're still working on it and the general thinking is still that serum is a better marker than dried urine for a menopausal woman so they're actually going to be I'm going to the annual IFM conference and the Dutch people are going to be there so I'm going to try and talk to them in here a little bit more women are asking me about it so it's out there I don't know who I don't know also who can order it so there's that as well hmm. there you go um, so some people will say well why don't you just order hormone levels through the conventional lab which I can do I can order estrogen progesterone DHEA testosterone I can order those labs through a conventional lab and that can work fine but what I'm really curious about when I'm doing hormone therapy with someone is the way in which their body is breaking down the hormones that's actually what I want to know so hormones are primarily broken down in the gut then they move to the liver and there's a two-step detoxification process that happens with the liver in the liver with all things that go through our gut and those processes are largely driven by our genes and there is a huge array of genetic variation in our genes in our liver that affects the way our body metabolizes life on earth like you talk to a woman who says I can't walk down the cleaning aisle in the grocery store and I'm thinking she's got some issues in her liver and her ability to detoxify I talked to a woman who has I think about this one woman who I took care of she was in her early 40s she had like the whole story she had um, early onset for her period horrible cramps horrible acne she had endometriosis she had fibroids and lo and behold guess what amidst all that hormone dysregulation she showed up with breast cancer and she was like between the fibroids and the breast cancer she was she healed her gut she was eating beautifully she was a dancer so she was moving her body hours a day like from a lifestyle from perspective through the course of her hormone journey she really learned how to take care of herself but still she ended up with this breast cancer and what I wanted to know was what how was her body breaking down her estrogen and was it doing it in a way that contributed to her risk for breast cancer and so that's one of the things that this test gives me um, and it's that estrogen metabolism square on the lower right hand side like this is what I want to know and if I really want to know I'm actually doing another test that's a urine test that's looking at a metabolite called 4-hydroxyestrone and that marker is being studied at Hopkins as a risk indicator for breast cancer and so that's what we did with this woman I did a, a slightly different panel that had the 4-hydroxyestrone and lo and behold her 4 was high so then we did a genetic panel to look at her genes and lo and behold she was missing many of the genes that we need to properly detoxify her hormone her hormones so even though she had done everything right from a lifestyle perspective and she had no family history her issue I think we think ended up in her genetic ability to break down her hormones and so I ask women to do this test once a year because I want to see those estrogen metabolism I want to see the estrogen metabolism if I'm gonna do something that has potential risk associated with it like prescribed hormone therapy I in the spirit of doing no harm I want to know what's happening with her estrogen metabolites and I can mark that with this test where I can't get this from a conventional lab so this looks at progesterone sex hormone binding globulin which is a carrier protein that shuttles hormones around our body interestingly it goes down does it go down or it goes up it goes up it goes up when there's high insulin right and so this is how it all ends up being like this right you've got high insulin now you've got high sex hormone binding globulin you've got a lot of hormone bound to the sex hormone binding globulin 
And so it's not free to function in your body, and so you've got profound hormone imbalance symptoms. Does that make any sense? It's like kind of more than you need to know, but I had a woman recently show up with the highest sex hormone binding globulin I've ever seen, and she, I, I called the lab to talk to, her, to them about her results in an opportunity to learn, as an opportunity to learn, and they, there are some things associated with sex hormone binding globulin, and they said, is she hyperinsulinemic? And I looked through her labs, and lo and behold, she was, even though she's like 5'3 and 103 pounds. Um, it looks at all of the estrogens, so estri E1S estrogen sulfate, estrone, those are storage estrogens in menopause. Estradiol is the largest circulating estrogen, that's generally the one that you're going to get if you're given hormone therapy, although there are fancy combinations of all the estrogens. Estriol, not super metabolically active, usually given at least by me for vaginal health for women who are having dry vagina and painful sex. DHEAS. Um, DHEA sulfate, this is sort of known as the fountain of youth hormone by the anti-aging community, it has to do with youth and vitality. I use it primarily for women who have severe adrenal fatigue. Um, t free and total testosterone, obviously libido, muscle mass, you know for women who are like, I am going to the gym and I am lifting and I got nothing, nothing at all. So I'm like, mm, I wonder what your testosterone level is. And if that's all we're looking at, I may just order that through the conventional lab. Right? So sometimes I'll do pieces of that through the conventional lab. And then the estrogen metabolism, which really for me is the gold in this test. Something like 180, minimum of 180, maximum of 380. Similar ballpark to the, to the stool test in terms of cost. Covered by Medicare. Do people have questions about that? Sometimes I do it because people want a baseline. Sometimes I do it because I want to know about the dosage that I'm giving them and how they're feeling, although I can usually get a sense of that by talking to them and their symptoms. Um, I generally, like I said, recommend it once a year. It, for me, it feels like part of doing no harm if I'm prescribing hormones. And not everybody does it, and that's okay. But I, it is what I recommend. Okay. So the other thing just to reiterate is that I use blood or serum for postmenopausal women on hormone therapy. And there's controversy in the literature as to what's the best medium for testing women's hormone. Is it saliva, is it serum, or is it urine? And it really depends on where the woman is hormonally and what it is that you want to test. So if you want to test the 4-hydroxyestrone, that metabolite that's associated with breast cancer, that's a urine test. If I have a woman who's cycling, she's still menstruating and I want to get a sense of her hormones, I'm using saliva. And that's what I learned in my tra training. So if you've got a menstruating woman, it's saliva and I'm going to pull one of those up, although we may not spend a lot of time on it. Um, just to show you. Um, so there, there is controversy, and then like we were saying, the Dutch test is urine. All right, so the NutriVal is a comprehensive nutritional evaluation. It is urine and it is blood, and the collection is a little bit laborious, which is complicated because I often use it for women who are not feeling awesome. Um, and it's like can be overwhelming just to even figure out how to get it done because you have to pee first thing in the morning and freeze your pee and freeze the freezer packs and bring the whole business to the lab the following day for a blood draw and you have to have filled out the paperwork and submitted payment information like it, there's multiple steps to it that for a woman who's not feeling well can be super complicated. Um, but for, I use this test for anybody with any sort of fatigue, um, any kind of cognitive decline, anybody who I want to know what their micronutrient status is. So one of the things that I have like a little, um, that makes me a little bit uncomfortable in sort of the world of functional medicine is how people get thrown supplements. Just like try this, try this, try this, try this, try this, try this. And that makes me a little bit crazy and because it's a lot of money, because you don't really know, because you're guessing, because 
things can affect pathways in ways that you don't can't really anticipate because there's no scientific method about it because did I say one size fits all it one size does not fit all so anyway I have a variety of issues with just giving people a ton of supplements without necessarily having clinical substantiation for my recommendations and so and I see women who are on a lot of supplements. I mean, women come in with lists and I'm just like, and they're like, well, I don't know what's helping. And I'm like, I don't really know what's helping you either. How could we ever possibly know? Like, and in the same way that I have concern about a laundry list of medication, I have concern about a laundry list of supplements too. I mean, if they're doing their job, then there's potential adverse risk and effects from them too, right? And it's the same thing with herbs. People are like, oh, it's just herbs. Well, if they're working, then we should be mindful with them. So the Nutraval looks at the Krebs cycle, which is the process through which our food gets converted to ATP, which is the energy molecule that's made within the energy center of the cell. And it looks at all of the nutrient cofactors that are required for that energy molecule to be made. So anybody who has any energy issue, and energy can be like energy, or it can be a depression that's an energy issue, a mitochondrial issue, or it can be a pain issue, or it can be a dementia, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's on that continuum issue, I'm looking at this test along with a woman who's like, tell me what to take that's specific to me. So for me, this is the best of what I know of that can offer personalized medicine that's available. So it's gonna look at, and I did not print off every page of this test because it's long, but I should have printed off at least the second page. I can pull it up um, separately after if people want to see it. So this is the take home page. And so it looks at antioxidants, it looks at B vitamins, it looks at minerals, it looks at vitamin D. The second page of this test is essentially a prescription for a custom vitamin. Um, and it also looks at all of the amino acids, the amino acids being the building blocks of protein and all our neurotransmitters and a whole host of other biochemical things in our body. It looks, this test also looks at omega-369 fatty acid indices to see if you've got the balance right or you have deficiencies in one kind or another. It looks at markers related to gut balance and uh, fungal overgrowth in the gut. It looks at markers related to neurotransmitter production, neurotransmitters being hormones that affect our mood. And it looks at heavy metals. Now the heavy metal test through this is not really the standard. But again, it's a little bit, it's like a benchmark. If I see an abnormal on this test in the metals, then I'm wondering if we should go a little bit deeper through a, a provocated urine test. So you get a prescription for a custom vitamin, which is something that's actually, you can purchase a custom vitamin. And you can, cu you can purchase a custom amino acid formula. And it can be a game changer for people. It can be a game changer. And at the very least, it takes out a fair amount of the guessing game. Not entirely, because, and again, it's not like it's one pill. That's the other thing it took me a little while to figure out. Like the custom vitamins end up being like a couple of small handfuls. <laughs> it's not like they tidily put it all in one pill. And then there's things that they can't put in it, like you're still taking omega-3 separately, you're still taking probiotics separately, you're still taking digestive enzymes separately. And then if you're being treated for something like bacteria Material overgrowth or a candida process, you're, those are extra supplements too. But at least you're not wondering, right? How much B12 is good for me? Do I need a B complex? What about CoQ10? What about vitamin C? How much is good for me? And do I have all of my amino acids in place or do I not? Because without them, you can't have optimal cognitive function. So I do this test quite a bit. Questions? Once you determine which supplements are needed, are those something that somebody would take for the rest of their life? I generally recommend people retest every year if they're not if they don't sort of acutely have something going on. 
because the need's gonna change, because we change, because we age, because we eat different, because we have more or less stress, because the number of daylight hours in the day, because it was a long, horrible, dark, gray winter, because we went to Florida for the winter, because, you know, all of those things factor in. So once a year, six months if, mon if money's not an issue. You know, if we took money out of the equation, I would look at it every six months. Yeah. This may be getting a little bit too deep since I actually did this. I, I know, I remember that I had to not take supplements in four days. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So, do the supplements stay in your system? Like, that it would change the outcome? I feel like I can't answer this question correctly. Where, if you get tested again in six months, if your body just normally doesn't hang on to these elements and nutrients, mm -hmm. would it most likely be at the same place if you've been out the supplements? Well, I, I'll, I'll, I'll answer and you can tell me if I got to it or not, <laughs> and then if I didn't, we'll figure it out. But So there is the idea of nutrient repletion, which is if you're deplete, you sort of add back for a while. And you know, the question is, well then do I have to take it forever? You know, and in theory, you're not just pill popping, right? I mean, this is the thing, it's a supplement, <laughs> which means it should be supplemental to what you're doing in terms of nutrition, lifestyle, stress management, you know, what else other imbalances are going on, what other ways in which are you trying to heal, thinking that once you optimize gut health, you're gonna get some kind of nutrient deplete, repletion, meaning put back. Now, the thing of that is we're always getting perfect. So she's hesitant about the black acts and I tried it once and I felt much better for a little while. Right. But not, you know, it wasn't lasting. Right. So um, now it's easier to get, it's not so expensive. Yep. So I met actually here in Coastal. Mm -hmm. I met one of the representatives and she encouraged me to go for it again because now it is covered. That's news to me. Thank you for sharing that. Do you know so, what the cause was? Because there's many causes of SIBO. You know, I have a adrenal insufficiency for one thing, mm -hmm. and it's been resistant my whole life because of that too. That all came into it. I had diabetes and that. Kind of complicated with all the different things that played into it. We'll share with you though, back in 2006, I think it was, when. I first was diagnosed with a male insufficiency. I went to women to women, saw Jay Riley there. Mm -hmm. I never felt better in my entire life than mm -hmm. when I was seeing her. Mm -hmm. When I went back to the endocrinologist, he said, you shouldn't be doing that. Mm -hmm. There's no science behind it. Mm -hmm. It's not, yeah. Yep. The biggest mistake I ever made. Was going back to the endocrinologist, yeah. Yep. yep. Never felt better. Right. Felt like a woman. Yep. Uh, Katrina, do you want to say something about SIBO? <laughs> <laughs> That's a lot about SIBO. Um, no, it's just, it's, we talk a lot about, I work with some of the supplement companies, and we talk a lot about SIBO. A lot of people have SIBO from it and diagnosed too. Right. But um, one of the, we talk about the brain gut connection too, and I don't know if, if anybody's ever spoken to you about, um, especially since you have constipation, there's vagal nerve exercises that you can do. Oh, yeah. I'm open to anything, I'm a nurse. Mm -hmm. um, I'm open to trying anything. So talk to Katrina afterward because Apex Energetics, the company that she works for, has yeah. the best SIBO handout ever that includes the dietary stuff. Yeah. Oh, wow. It promotes their product line, which they actually have a probiotic that I love that's specific for people with SIBO. Apex. Apex. Yeah. And then I just learned about that because yeah. I came here and asked if they could make me a and um, they said the science wasn't there. So then I went back to Deirdre and yeah. she said, oh yeah, Apex has made a... Yeah. So, yeah. 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 So part of what I love about that SIBO handout is it has the it has the vagal exercises on it, the gargling, and what's the other one? Gargling, the, tongue, tongue, tongue depressor. You can Google like vagal nerve exercises. There's like a gazillion of them, but singing really loudly, um, but gargling, <laughs> like gargling water or really actively gargling yeah. until tears come out of your eyes. I do that multiple times a day. Wow. Cold shower, water blast. 
Yeah. 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 So SIBO is small intestine bacterial overgrowth, so it's looking at the small intestine, whereas the GI effects is looking at the large intestine. And there's a variety of reasons where there can be an overcolonization of bacteria in the small intestine, or it can ascend from the large intestine to the small intestine. And I would say that clinically, the primary presenting symptom that I see is bloating, like persistent bloating. Like I'm fine in the morning when I wake up, and by the end of the day, I look like I'm nine months pregnant. I mean, how many times have I heard that? That's like, that's what in my mind I'm like, oh, she probably has SIBO. So Genova has a SIBO test. Um, what's, it's essentially a breath test. So you drink a drink that makes the bacteria in your small intestine ferment the sugars into methane and hydrogen. And then through breath analysis, those are measured. And you're looking for a particular elevation over baseline over the two hour course that hits diagnostic criteria for a diagnosis. They're now whittling out, there's a, some difference thought to be between methane driven SIBO versus hydrogen driven SIBO and some treat differences in treatment recommendations depending on what you're diagnosed with. So this is something that's actually done. This is like, it's amazing, but standard gastroenterologists are actually acknowledging this now. And Ben Potter, who's a GI, not to name names, but Ben Potter is a Portland GI who I have had many women come back and say, well, I saw Dr. Potter and I was diagnosed with SIBO. And I'm like, thank you, Dr. Potter. Yay. Like he's reading the research, he's paying attention, and he's open-minded. I just made an appointment with him. Yeah. And I said, I understand that there's one doctor that is, you know, into the SIBO, and he said, oh, everybody has SIBO. Yeah. That's not true, they're all, yeah. you know, it just, yeah. So, but I do think that there is growing recognition in the conventional gastroenterology community around small intestine bacterial overgrowth. I do think that that's gaining traction. And um, it tends to be recurrent. It tends to be hard to eradicate. Uh, it's a huge lifestyle piece, like Katrina was saying, in terms of stress and the gut-brain connection and all of that. And the conventional treatment, this one specific antibiotic that stays local to the small intestine has been not covered by most insurance companies, super expensive even when it is covered. And I mean, I've had women go to Canada to get it, not because I said so, because they were like, I can't get it, I can't spend a thousand dollars, but I can get it other places for less money. $1,200 There you go. And the treatment- They got nowhere with asking for it, so I went to the company myself. Yep. And they gave me my first. Right, but. right, but 10 days is definitely not enough in terms of treatment. And what I I will say is that um, Jerry Mullen, who is a Hopkins gastroenterologist, who's, I think, I, in my world, he was the guy who brought SIBO sort of to the forefront in popular culture. He is hard into the botanical treatments. And because the Zyfaxin is so hard to get in, because recurrence rates are so high, um, and for all of those reasons, and, and, and according to him, the data is there that supports botanic treatments as being as effective. Also for Candida as well, and that's a little bit of an aside, but um, it used to be that we used Diflucan and Nystatin, a compounded Nystatin, because the regular Nystatin has sugar in it. Go figure that. But the studies are there now that show that the botanical treatment for Candida is as good, if not better, in terms of treatments. I haven't actually prescribed Diflucan or Nystatin in over a year since I heard his lecture about that, and it seems to be going really well. So measuring methane, me measuring hydrogen, looking for the sustained elevation. So that's a sample of what the results look like. Oh my, and that's exactly what I was trying to avoid. Oh no. <laughs> if I close it, will it go away? Okay, there. <laughs> good. <laughs> Questions? We're good on time. I think we're just at, we've got like 15 minutes. Awesome. That was great. So oh, you go ahead. Um, the first test on your, uh, like things that you're, um, it, well, that sense of like your shoulder red mm -hmm. scars. So what if you haven't eaten cheese like for two weeks or something mm -hmm. before? It won't show up. Sometimes it does. Oh, so even if it's been like a while? Sometimes it does, sometimes it doesn't, and that's what I mean is like it's not 100%. It's not diagnostic. 
per se. It doesn't have a 100% accuracy rate. So I would, I mean, what I tell people is eat. Be like a normal person. Eat what you want to eat. Eat and then do the test. Don't like, unless you know that you can't eat gluten and function in your life, don't do that. But, you know, if you think dairy is upsetting you, but you are kind of curious and you want to know if you can have some, that's we're more likely to get a better, a better result, a, more, a truer result. Yeah. So I've been reading contradictory things about whether dairy is inflammatory for everyone. Mm -hmm. Do you have any take on that? I am really not into blanket dietary recommendations. Um, I get the rationale behind that recommendation. I understand the potential, but I, because I only take care of women, and for so many women, food is a really sensitive topic, and historically, women have given their power away to other people about what the right thing is to eat, such that we've now created a bazillion dollar industry, and people have no idea what to eat anymore. I really shy away from blanket recommendations I know as many people who have cured cancer through a macrobiotic diet as they have ended up in the emergency room with nutrient deficiency. You know, in the same way that some people feel great on a keto diet and other people feel like they're going crazy. In the same way that some people feel best when they have no carbs and other people want to hurt someone if they don't have any carbohydrates. And I think that there's such a giant range of biochemical individuality that to make these swooping general and again, I get it. Like, I don't think dairy's awesome. I don't think it's probably, I think not organic dairy is definitely not awesome. I think huge amounts of dairy, like I don't, in my opinion, nobody needs to be drinking milk. I mean, as I said to my pediatrician when my kids were little, cow milk for baby cow like breast milk for baby person. But we've been culturing these foods and using animals for food sources forever to varying degrees. So is a little bit of cheese or a little bit of yogurt or a little bit of kefir bad? Not for everybody, I don't think. And the data on kefir, by the way, in terms of having good probiotics and having gut healing properties is robust. Is that only if it doesn't have any sort of sweetener in it? Yeah, I mean, you want the highest, right? This is the other issue. You want the highest quality, most locally sourced, best treated animals that you can afford. That matters, in my opinion. So, and I get where the dairy recommendation is coming from, I do. You know, again, to me, it's just like, are you drinking gallons of milk? Or are you, having a little bit of high quality, you know, Greek yogurt once a week. That to me is going to create a different thing in the body. So that's where I stand, in the middle. I stand for women connecting the food that they eat with the way it makes them feel. That's what I stand for. And it's up to each of us to identify what we eat and how we feel, which means slowing down, paying attention, and trusting ourselves. And we stink at all of that. So we get to practice. Okay. <laughs> what do you think of these biome biome tests? You know that? No? You know that? It's like an artificial intelligence of the poop. A test of the poop. <laughs> biome. I haven't heard of it. So how do they do it? How is it done? I, I don't really know how it processed, but it takes like four to six weeks if you send it in the poop. Violence. I'm not, I haven't, I'm sorry. You can send it to me though, I'm curious. You can Google it. Yeah. Okay, Viome. Yeah. Sounds to me like they're looking at the microbiome right. <laughs> and it's just like, yeah, you know, another, way. another, right, it's just another company, to, like, you know, developing their technology yeah. to try and get a sense of what's going on. And it's, more, it's open to the, the public. Right. Yeah, the, the public. The like 23 and me. Yeah, anybody. Yeah. Anybody yeah. But I don't know how reliable that is. Right. Yeah. Other questions? 
Well, thanks for coming out tonight. Great. Thanks Thank for all your participation. Thanks to Coastal for hosting. Have a good night. Thank you.